Can anyone tell me what the Shema or Shema is? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I always thought it was the Shema. It's what we heard in the scripture today. Any Jew would tell you in a second. It is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is the Shema. And they were to write it, the scripture says they were to write it and wear it around their wrist, on their forehead. You've seen people wear like, like those bandanas, I guess it's that. Painted above their doorpost, over the gateway. They were to put it everywhere, and they were to say it several times a day. That's what a Jew said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And so today in these scriptures, we hear the Shema. And uh, I would say the, the Shema is as, was as common to the Jews, is as common to the Jews as our making the sign of the cross. All you have to do is stand out here in front of the church and you see all the Catholics, even the ones who never go to church, they all make sign of the cross. Somehow that got embedded in them. So they stop there and they go off and do their business. Uh, some people do it when something ha bad happens. Mercy, mercy, mercy. And they're making the sign of the cross, okay? But it, it's, it's just what the Jews did. Now, the interesting thing to me is uh, first of all, I don't think it's in Luke and it's not in John, but it's in Matthew and Mark. And it is commonly held by most scripture scholars, I believe, that Mark was the first gospel written, even though in the Bible it's second. And there's lots of reasons why it's believed to be the first. For one thing, Matthew and Luke use Mark as a source and they draw from Mark uh, a lot of their material. Plus, they have another source which in scripture studies is called the quell, from the German Q, and that is another source that Matthew and Mark, I mean Matthew and Luke drew from in addition to Mark, and then they had a couple of sources that were just their own. The interesting thing is, Mark wrote his first, and then Matthew wrote it and drew it most likely from Mark, but he dropped something out. He dropped the whole second part out, and it just occurred to me, I, if, if you had asked me uh, last Monday, uh, which is the longer one, I would have said probably Matthew. Because uh, it's one thing to add things to Scripture, for Matthew to get Mark and then add to it, that's normal, but to drop something out? So I thought about it. First of all, I actually went to my usccb.org, which is the, the bishop's site. It has the whole Bible on there, plus the readings of every day. And I went right to this reading, and then I went to the footnotes to look. Tell me, explain to me why he dropped it out. It wasn't there at all. So I thought, well, obviously it's not a question for everybody. So then I thought, why could he do it? Here's my theory, and I'd like to give it to you as homework. Google it, okay? Not now during Mass. Google it and see if you can come back and tell me next week why. But this is why I think it is. In, when, when Jesus gives the Shema, the scribe asks him, now you know the, the Jews had 616 laws, and certainly, I'm thinking that among the more important ones would have been what took place in the temple, the offering of the sacrifice, especially the daily sacrifice to, to wipe away our sin. This would be very important to the Jews. But uh, he says to Jesus, Jesus, what's the first commandment, the most important one? So Jesus gives the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then he says, and he wasn't even asked for a second one, but he gives a second one. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And really he gives three, but he calls it two only because loving your neighbor and loving yourself are two. So he wraps up this package. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I contend, as I write in the notes in the bulletin today, that the reversal is probably better to think of it this way. If you love yourself, and a lot of people don't, by the way. I hear it all the time. They're filled with shame and guilt and self-hatred and low self-esteem. But if you love yourself and respect and honor yourself, it's probably pretty easy to love your neighbor because you know what love is and, and you, you appreciate who and what you are, even with defects. But if you love yourself and love your neighbor, you're already loving God. That's already an expression of love for God, to love his creation. So Jesus adds to it, and then, then he says, it's, this is the greatest of the commandments. And then the scribe responds to it and he says, wow, Jesus. I'm interpreting a little here. Why, Jesus? Wow. Yes, 
to love, your, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself, is worth more than any burnt offering or sacrifice. And this, I contend, is why Matthew removed it. The reason I think he removed it is because he wrote the gospel to the Jews. That's what the nickname for Matthew's gospel, the gospel to the Jews, for all kinds of reasons we won't go into. And if they viewed the sacrifice and the sacrifice for our sins as one of the most important things, then it would be an attack against the very message of, of following the law and the prophets. And, and I, I think Matthew would see it as almost heresy to say it. Just get rid of that. But Mark doesn't. And his Jesus tells us that to love God, to love neighbor and self, is worth more than the burnt offering or sacrifice. Now, this may not be an exactly fair comparison, but I'll say it. I'd say that in Jesus' words in Mark, he might say that loving God, neighbor, and self is more important than coming to the Eucharist. Because it's possible to come to the Eucharist every week, every day for that matter, and not love our neighbor. Probably not love ourselves too much, and I guess we still love God, but I'm not sure. Of course, I always hearken back to uh, um, one of my data sources for this. There was a woman in one of my parishes, and um, she went to every single Mass, even when the, and received communion at every single Mass, even when the law said you couldn't. Because it used to be that if you went to Mass uh, four times in one day, you could only receive communion once. Only the priest, because he was celebrating the Mass, and he has to receive. But the church changed it at, uh, after the council and said, you, first, first it made two changes. The first change was, you, if you go to three Masses in one day, but they're all three distinct Masses, one is, say, the morning Mass, one's a funeral, and one's a wedding, you could receive because they're distinct, wed, uh, distinct Masses with distinct readings and distinct purposes. But if your parish had six Sunday Masses, you couldn't go to each one and receive it each one because they were all the same Mass. But eventually the church has said, ah, forget it. If you're celebrating the Eucharist, receive communion. Well, even before the church said that, I assume that she was receiving it every Mass, breaking the law. And you know why the church had the law there in the first place? It was for one of those negative reasons. If you thought that you were more holy because you received communion six times rather than one time, then you don't understand God's love in the Eucharist, the infinite love that, we, that touches us. So the church says, don't abuse it. Don't keep receiving. Uh, receive once and appreciate the gift of that Eucharistic love. But finally the church said, no, if you're celebrating the Eucharist, of course you should receive. But her proof to me was this. She really was a nasty person. <laughs> she really didn't like people a lot. And she would tell me after Mass, did you see that person singing over there? I don't like the way they sing. And I thought, well, who cares, you know? And then she complained about this. And she's receiving communion all these Masses, being loved by Christ in the Eucharist, but what? So this is a very interesting issue, this issue of loving God, neighbor, and self. You know, Years ago, uh, when they opened this museum in Los Angeles called the Museum of Tolerance, I went. It was very impressive. I don't know if many of you have gone down on Pico. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary, but I hate it on one level. Imagine having to make a Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles and several other places, enshrining this. Here's the question. Can we at least tolerate each other? That means... Can we put up with one another? I can't stand his music that he plays so loud every day, but I'll put up with it. That's what neighbors do. When she cooks, it smells so bad, I, can't, I just want to die. But hey, we all have different tastes. It's okay. And so I'll put up with them. Well, that's the bare minimum, isn't it? The bare minimum. It seems to me that Jesus was not saying that Love one another, put up with them. Just stick your head in the sand and put up with them. We need the Museum of Tolerance because we don't even tolerate each other. Look at the murder of the Jews in Pittsburgh. Can't even tolerate that people are a, a particular race or, or creed or, or think or believe differently than me. Hate them. Got to get rid of them and kill them. Really? How intolerant could we be? 
So we need the Museum of Tolerance. It, it, that's pretty basic. But that's not what Jesus is after. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then this person listening to Jesus got it. No, I get it, what you're saying, Lord. That's more important than any sacrifice to God. I guess it's so complex because we use the word love so often. You know, there's classically three words for love. Eros, from which comes words like erotic, and it's sexual, but it's not. It's also just sensual. It's, it's like being in love, I guess. It's that, that just erotic delight of love. That's the lowest one. The next one is filial love. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, filial it's, it's we're, we're brothers and sisters in families, so we love each other because we have this dignity and the relationship by blood. We, we must. Loving my brother is loving me. Loving my sister is loving me. That's, that's, that's what Jesus is talking about. But the highest love of all is agape. Agape. It's what we celebrate. They often call the Eucharist the agape. Agape is I'd be willing to put down my life for another. That's, that's the meaning of love for me. I give myself, even my life, for others. It's the cross. Jesus on the cross, he practiced agape to the max because he wasn't willing to put down his life just for people that he felt love for, but the people who were spitting in his face and killing him. He laid down his life for them, and as he did it, he said, Father, forgive them all. They know not what they do. Instead of hating, he loved, he forgave. That's what he holds up to us, the highest form of love. And it ain't easy. But you know, I learned a long time ago, I know some of you heard me say this, but, but for me this was an important distinction. Some of you may argue with me and say, this just ain't so, but I think it is. Um, when I grew up in my family, there were six of us, and I was the second to the youngest, and the third to the oldest, it was Gary, Jerry, then Terry, then Blank, Barry, Perry, Larry, and and Terry was 10 years older than me, and Terry frightened me. Terry, um, we were all big mouths in my family. That, it wasn't that, but he ha had an anger and, and a, an edge to him. And when he'd get mad, his face would get red. He'd huff and puff and he'd get red, and then this vein would stick out. He'd say, Arr! and I was 10 uh, when he was 20, 5 when he was 15, and he scared me. Uh, he never hit me, never did anything to hurt me, but, but he scared me. So we went on. I grew up. I became a priest. He was married, has a daughter. And, and you know, uh, he and I, I suppose neither of us really changed all that much fundamentally. Uh, and, and he didn't scare me anymore, but I found him obnoxious. And he'd always argue with me, and I'd argue with him because uh, I just did. But... It came to a head one day. I'd been a priest for about seven years. I went home to lunch with my mom and dad and, and uh, my day off, and, and he pops in the door because he worked nearby, and he'd always come over, and I said, leech off my mom and dad, you know. Here he was, a uh, young man. And so he comes over, and uh, we got into it about something. I don't remember what it was. It was ridiculous. But it was particularly ridiculous this time. It, it was so, so dumb and as, we, as, as the temperature kept rising and we're getting into it more and more, I finally, in exasperation, turned to him and I said, Terry, Terry, wait, you cannot possibly believe what you're saying. It is so ridiculous. It is so stupid. You cannot possibly believe it. And he goes like this, oh, I don't. I just love arguing with you. <laughs> oh, my God. I left... When I get excited, I talk out loud like a crazy person. I really do. I, in the car, I'll, I'll get excited. For whatever emotion, I am excited. And I had this conversation with me in the car, and I look in the mirror, I'm driving, and I say, you've got to be the biggest idiot. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And this is the conclusion I came to. It just like, it all bubbled up and boom, right in my face. I said, you know, my brother's toxic. He's toxic. Uh, I can't blame him for the argument because I'm dumb enough to get into it with him. So I'm equally responsible. But why I would let, allow him 
to push the buttons that would allow me to respond like that and end up like this, I said he's toxic. So I said this. It was, a, it was, it was this kind of a conclusion. I'll love him from a distance. I said this. He's my brother, filial. I'll do anything for him that he ever needs, agape. I'll do it. Anything he needs, he asks of me, I'll do it because I love him. He's my brother. But I won't go out to pizza with him. Mm -mm -mm. I won't go out to pizza with him because I wouldn't enjoy it. And we'd probably end up arguing. I, I share this today because, you know, I just hear so many problems with love in the confessional in my office and whatever, in my life, other people's lives. The difficulty of loving. Uh, some people put it this way. Well, I love my husband, but I'm not in love with him. And I think, oh, really? Okay. Don't, don't say more, please. <laughs> you know. But I, real, I get that, you know. You know, even with spouses sometimes, maybe they don't want to have pizza together. You know, maybe it's just awkward. And, and maybe it's because in so many ways we stop being self-reflective. We stop checking our own selves out. Am I lovable the way I act? Am I lovable the way I speak to people? Or should something change? You know, that's part of the beauty of that little card. Check myself out every 24 hours. When was I my best version? When was I not my best version? Is there anything, God, is there anything, God, that I need to change? And why? Well, erotic love, it's the lowest. It's kind of like animal love, practically. Filial love, you know, they say, you can't, you can't uh, change who, who are your you're stuck with them. That's all there is to it. But when it's a good filial love, we appreciate our brothers and sisters and we want to have a, a good friendship with them. And agape, no matter what, is what Jesus asks us to do, to pour out our lives for others. And so I've come to the clu conclusion that what Jesus is saying is not that we need to be in love with everyone, but we must love everyone. Even our, He goes so far, even say, our enemies, those who persecute us, those who hate us, we must love them. And to love them, it seems to me, means something like this, to want good for them no matter what, to ask blessing for them no matter what, to help them if and when we can. Don't have to go out to pizza, but help them if and when we can. To only want them to become the best version of who we can, they can be. And if maybe I could be an influence to them by challenging them, by questioning them, by encouraging them, maybe I could even contribute to them taking a step to becoming a better version. Jesus said today, of all the commandments that are out there, there's 616 of them in our Jewish life, I'll tell you the most important. And it ain't one it ain't two, it's three, and they're all tied together. You must love the Lord your God, your Creator and Father, with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your strength, with everything that you've got in you. And you must not be in love, but love your neighbor as you love yourself.